Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome back to the ENCODE Polkadot Educate series. Um, I'm just going to invite our speaker to the stage. So today's session, um, as you can see in the chat, is um, an intro to Substrate. Hello. Um, and uh, with a, a color state case study. Um, and we've got speaker Brian Chen from Akala here with us today. Um, Brian has kindly shared his slides ahead of time. So if you look in the chat, uh, there's a link for them. Also, you can um, follow Brian and Akala Network uh, on Twitter. I've just dropped them in the chat as well, as well as us at, at Encode Club. Um, and yeah, follow us to keep updated with the rest of the series. Hello, everybody. If you are here, feel free to drop a little message in the chat. Um, and Brian, uh, hello. Uh, you're more than welcome hello. to start sharing your screen. Um, Brian, feel free to introduce yourself. I am going to leave the stage now, so take it away. Cool. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Brian and Akala. So that was about myself. Um, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Hakala, and also as well as a senior Polkadot ambassador and part member of the a senior fellows at Polkadot Fellowship. And I'm also a contributor to Substrate Polkadot and implement a bunch of features and suggestions to um, the Polkadot and Substrate. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk, give a... Um, intro to high level intros to substrate and highlighting some of the unique features of substrates. Why you might be, if you want to build a new blockchain, why substrate um, could be a good idea. And as well as do a case study on Polkadot and Alcala, uh, highlighting how Polkadot is built with substrate and also highlighting some uh, unique features from how Alcala leveraging uh, many unique features from substrates to help building a better DeFi platforms for the Polkadot ecosystem. So let's get started. So um, Substrate is a blockchain building framework. And, and let me explain a bit more about like why uh, we need a Substrate. Um, before Substrate exists, um, in order to build a complete blockchain, well, obviously that is definitely possible, but it does require a lot of work. Like you need to implement the consensus algorithms, uh, figure out exactly uh, how to retrieve consensus between all the networks. Uh, you need to do a bunch of P2P networking code, which is hard. Uh, it's really hard. <laughs> um, and you also have a transition pools. So you need to have a bunch of cryptographic primitives, like signature verifications, a, a lot of um, advanced tricks to make things faster, make things secure. Uh, which is why well, if you don't have a degree on this, you shouldn't write any code about it. Um, uh, obviously, there are a lot of lower level um, data structure things, picking the right data structure for the right job, uh, which itself is also a lot of considerations because that also impacts the security. Um, you also need a client SDK. So obviously, the front end will be able to talk uh, with the blockchain, with the SDK. People can build mobile apps, uh, you probably want SDK in different languages as well. Um, so that, again, is also a lot of work. And then, obviously, you need some U UIs, you need some wallets, browser wallets, or uh, extension wallets, mobile wallets, desktop wallets, etc. So it's just a lot of work uh, required uh, if you want to build a new blockchain completely from scratch. Um, it, usually, it was usually done... Um, in different ways. So uh, the most easy way would be just write a smart contract and deploy it to existing platforms. And that would be uh, write Solidity contracts, deploy it to Ethereum, or a bunch of other uh, smart contract platforms. They have its own limitations. And all you can fork existing projects. Uh, there are a lot of Bitcoin fork projects out there. Uh, there are a bunch of Ethereum for projects out there, so that is uh, definitely doable. Um, but again, that is still not ideal um, because uh, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, when they implemented, well, they aim to implement Bitcoin Ethereum, they're not trying to build a generalized blockchain building framework. 
Um, so this will make um, customizations a bit harder um, because well, they are not designed for people to fork and fork file. Or you can obviously always build from scratch. And again, you need to build every single component and a lot more um, from scratch. They just cost money and cost time. Um, so that's the reason um, Substrate is built. Um, it allows us to do blockchain innovations without doing all the hard works, implement all the low level stuff um, from scratch. Um, is developed by the party, uh, lead by Kevin Wood. Um, so they are probably the only things with uh, production experience building multiple blockchain clients. Uh, party obviously previously built the party Ethereum node, now called Open Ethereum. Um, they also built Bitcoin client, Zcash client. So they have tons of blockchain uh, nodes building experience. And obviously those experience translates to, uh, they learn a lot of from those experience and translate to the foundation of the substrate. Uh, so substrate is complete. It provides all the necessary modules for the blockchain development and all the components I mentioned before and, and more are all provided by substrate. So it comes with a demonstration blockchains they already implement the smart contract in order for the POS blockchain. So in theory, you could just take it uh, without much modification other than uh, some configurations to make a production ready, and bam, you have a blockchain. So it is fairly easy. Of course, the more important thing is everything are actually designed to be customizable. Um, so that when you want to modify something, um, the frameworks offer you the way to perform additional configurations rather than trying to hack in the code, try to figure out exactly where to tweak the certain, certain behavior. Um, some keywords. Um, so obviously uh, you, you need to know Rust, substrate is built with Rust. And Wasm is a big component in the substrate. And it's using the Wasm time executor to uh, execute the version. The networking is done with lib P2P. The storage is uh, done with Rocks DB. And Parity have built a new Parity DB and uh, mainly uh, for substrate. So they should uh, create the more performance improvement compared to Rocks DB. But this is a tiny bit more experimental. So it's not enabled by default. Um, so substrate offers a lot of features um, compared to other blockchains. Um, so I'm going to highlight um, some of those features and explain them. So firstly is upgradable. That is uh, one of the selling points of Substrate uh, because that is that when you have this feature, you, you cannot imagine how others building blockchain without upgrade abilities. So previously, um, Blockchains need to hard fork, perform a fork to perform upgrade. Um, that is just well, not that good. Uh, blockchains are immutable data structure in some way. Um, so the way it's uh, immutable makes upgrade always a hard thing to perform. And so you kind of always need to uh, do a coordination uh, with pretty much everyone um, to upgrade the software before certain blocks and then on the certain blocks and uh, you can uh, everyone the software will detect and uh, employ the new rules so there's hard fork but that requires um, coordination of the a lot of option components uh, a lot of centralization issues because someone needs to talk with everyone and convince this is indeed a legit next upgrade version um, and then people can always just hard fork and hijack the chain, which have done before. Um, so hard fork is not really a great way um, not a, uh, to upgrade your blockchain. But that is uh, un over, un unavoidable for many blockchains without the ability to upgrade. Um, so some projects, they do have every um, six months or so, um, every few months, 
they will do a regular, a regular hard fork uh, to implement new features. Um, but you're not going to have this problem uh, if you're building a blockchain with substrate because it can just uh, perform random upgrades without a uh, fork and everything is coordinated uh, by the on-chain consensus logics um, to solve all, pretty much all the problems I've mentioned. Uh, let me explain a bit more um, on exactly how the upgradeability um, is achieved. So um, a substrate build blockchain has many consists of two parts. One is the on-chain component that is we usually call it the runtime. Uh, it's pretty much a state transition functions, a state transition functions that is like, it's basically a function with input of previous state, a block, and output to the next uh, state. Uh, when you're linking them together, you have a blockchain. Uh, so that is the runtime. And then the client. Um, client is pretty much everything uh, except the runtime. So all the off-chain components that are not enforced by the on-chain uh, mechanism. Uh, that, so that including the storage, um, the uh, file system database, uh, things to store uh, the old blocks, old state, et cetera. Uh, the consensus engines, um, how to decide which block is the next block, uh, how to finalize the block, determine uh, which block, if a block is finalized. Uh, the networking part, uh, actually sending network message to all the peers and do the other things like peer discovery and all the RPCs as well as the uh, words and executors that actually execute the word, the on-chain runtime uh, to enforce, uh, to perform the state transition. So the upgrade usually means uh, the runtime is forkless upgradable. Uh, you can still uh, do a fork by uh, upgrade the client, uh, which will require off-chain coordinations, um, but it's just that we usually doesn't need to do that. Uh, a very simple diagram. So we have a bunch of runtime code written in Rust, and then we can just using the Rust to chain to compile them to Wasm, uh, which is just a Wasm uh, binary. And then we can go through some on-chain governance state transition uh, function. So that is determined by the runtime logic to determine which one, uh, like how exactly the uh, on-chain governance process works. Like for example, if you are on testnet, uh, you probably will have a sudo and uh, then someone with the sudo key will be able to just uh, set the runtime. And if you have a production networks, you probably don't have to do, and then you'll be using one of the governance pilots offered by Substrate and doing some on-chain voting process um, to determine the next uh, runtime. And then once the governance process is successful, uh, it will be commit to the on-chain state. And then uh, on the client side, uh, when the runtime is commit to non chain state, uh, you will see the network peers. Uh, the subject client will be communicate communicate with network peers to import new blocks, uh, which include the new runtime. And then um, the new it will execute the new block and uh, do the on chain state transition function, and come up with a new state. So update the on chain state, and then on the next block, um, it will fetch the new version runtime from the on-chain state and use that uh, to execute the next block. Um, so this is, um, if you think of a different way, imagine if you build Ethereum with Java and then you have a smart contracts and then you can upload a Java bytecode, a Java file, um, to the smart contracts. And then the client would download the JAR code from the smart contracts and self-upgrade itself. And then use the new clients to execute the next block. This will essentially implement the upgrade abilities on Ethereum. But obviously it's not implementing Java. There are a lot of other considerations required. Uh, but in theory, it's possible to implement this on other blockchains. 
uh, it just it's very hard to get make sure it's secure and it's done correctly. Uh, because for example, the words at right time could be different on different blocks, and you need to make sure you always execute uh, the legal the old blocks, historical blocks using the right words. Otherwise, you you may result an uh, inconsistent outcome. Let me. I see a lot of chats. Uh, let me see if you, anyone have questions. Uh, what are the prerequisites to learn such a framework and how long it takes to learn? Uh, you need to know blockchains, obviously. Um, you need to know Rust. Uh, those are the main thing. And then, well, you just need to learn it. <laughs> Uh, how long it takes to learn this is kind of and um, depends. Um, some people learn fast, some people take the more time, but usually it will be something like two to three months, and then you will be able to write some um, toy projects. And then if you want to uh, start writing production code, they will probably take a bit more time. Uh, I'm interested in building a mobile OS using Substrate. How could I use Substrate for it? That doesn't make too much sense because Substrate is a blockchain building framework. It's not exactly um, a operating system thing. Um, but you can, um, if you want to build in a mobile nat um, blockchain native mobile operating system, uh, then Substrate could be useful to handle the, handles the blockchain part. Okay, uh, let's continue on the next feature, uh, light client. I gave literally just post to Twitter um, a few days ago, uh, talking about a small dot is production, uh, is like 1.0 release, uh, which is uh, a very uh, big things. So light client is essential for any trusted access to the blockchain network. Um, so I'm really, so this is like one of the most critical components for any trustless blockchains. And not every blockchain can be, can have like clients. So this um, is also a fundamental difference between uh, Polkadot and the whole Polkadot ecosystem and some other blockchain projects. Um, because that is the only way through like clients to allow say a web page, a mobile app, an IoT device, to validate uh, the on-chain state uh, of a blockchain without downloading all the blocks, uh, executing everything, uh, all the compute intensive work. Uh, it can very efficiently uh, to input, uh, to validate the headers, uh, validate a storage. So this is down through uh, one thing is the trade DB as with uh, Patricia local trade, so you can with the state root, including the header, you can verify uh, the value of a particular state. And then with the grandpa and other um, consensus, uh, it is possible to perform a wrap sync uh, to verify uh, the, the latest block and headers uh, in a matter of only a few seconds. So small dot is the implementation um, of the subject clients and because it is built in such a way, uh, it can be compiled towards them and run inside a browser. Um, so uh, Substrate Connect is a browser extension that embeds small dot uh, running a lot clients inside the browser extensions. And then the web app will be able to communicate to the browser extensions uh, to assess the latest on-chain state without using RPC nodes, for example. And um, it's a browser extension, just a matter of optimizations, uh, but you can uh, implement the similar code in your web app directly uh, without using, without depending on the subject connect extensions uh, to trustlessly uh, communicate with the blockchains without using, uh, without depending on the RPC nodes. So you don't need to just eliminate the centralization considerations of RPC nodes. So next feature, uh, Substrate is built with the uh, modularized, modularized components. Um, so that way is, um, means um, it's designed to be um, 
a lot of components are designed to be um, pluggable, uh, can be replaced with something else. Uh, you can customize a lot of things. Uh, so like Polkadot itself is using Babe concerns. Uh, many power trends are using Aura concerns. Uh, they are uh, proof of work based substrate solo trains. Now, obviously, a lot of testnet are proof of authorities. Um, and then like, um, for example, in Akala node itself, uh, it's the power train is using Aura plus Cumulus as a power train, but you can run it as the uh, testing uh, client uh, for testing purpose and then into using the proof of authority uh, locally uh, for testing purpose. So it can uh, a single binary can implement uh, supports multiple consensus depending on the network um, it is connecting. And then uh, pretty much everything can be customized, the, including the transition format, address format, uh, cryptographic primitives, etc. And one example is uh, actually in the Moonbeam uh, power chains. They're trying to be Ethereum compatible, so they've customized the transition, um, the address format uh, instead of the standard um, base 58, they customize to the Ethereum uh, format. Uh, it customizes the signature format to use the Ethereum signature. Um, so you can customize substrate uh, to uh, build the Ethereum fork. And next, uh, very unique features I'm not aware of exists or any other um, platforms that is the blockchain worker. A lot of blockchain protocols depending on blockchain components. Um, and that is a hard problem to address. And there's a lot of protocols are being created uh, on Ethereum just to solve this. Uh, but Substring uh, offers off-chain workers to completely solve those problems. Uh, so uh, basically a runtime can embed off-chain workers uh, with enhanced API that can assess a lot of things that run on-chain runtime code are not allowed to assess. So off-chain workers can assess HTTP. Uh, so you can pretty much, for example, query uh, exchanges or coin market cap to query the uh, Oracle price data. Um, it has its own local database, so you can store whatever uh, information there. It can assess a secure randomness. Um, it, have, it can assess to a key store for signing purpose. Um, so this one, um, can be, for example, implemented to uh, implement oracles and many other features. And one important thing is that uh, it's, up, it's part of a runtime. So when the runtime upgrades, the off-chain workers also upgrades. This solve, uh, solve a big problem with existing um, off-chain components of blockchains. That because blockchains need to upgrade, off-chain uh, components need to upgrade, but Usually, one of them will upgrade first before the other one. And then you need to make sure the other components uh, have a backward compatible code to handle both the new and old version. That is just like long more work. And there is also uh, the more code and just maintenance work because like option components, there's no, you need to coordinate with everyone to make sure they all upgrade before certain deadlines. Otherwise, thing might break. Um, you don't have this problem with offshore workers because like, they just upgrade with runtime. Uh, when the runtime upgrade is performed, um, all offshore workers will be upgraded on the exact same block. Um, so you don't really need to worry about um, the transition format compatibility, for example. Uh, if the transition format have changed, that's fine. The offshore workers will be upgraded to use the new format along with runtime at the same time. Um, so I'll show some use cases. Um, I'm going to, so um, the lightness is actually used on the Polkadot itself uh, to uh, make sure the, the data are uh, alive. And the Polkadot is also using option waters to perform the uh, DPoS, um, sorry, MPoS, normally proof of a uh, stake algorithms. Uh, I'm going to describe those uh, but more in a later case study. 
And yeah, Substrate just offers a lot of ways to develop. Uh, you can, in theory, um, using any compiled version languages uh, to build a runtime. You don't have to use Substrate and Rust, but you can build um, your own framework. Um, but it does require a lot of work to build such framework. I believe there are some things are uh, trying uh, building alternative um, framework for this, but they are uh, not production ready, uh, but it's definitely possible. So usually people will use build with brain, um, using pilots to build substrate. Um, you can also um, build uh, with ink, a smart contract framework with Rust uh, built by Parity um, to deploy on um, ink enabled uh, blockchain, uh, substrate chain. And you can always just build with Solidity or any EVN language and deploy it on EVN enabled chains, uh, which we have already a bunch of them, including Akala uh, in the Polkadot and Kusama power chain. And good things about that Rust is that, and uh, Wazen is that uh, Rust community um, have a rich of Wazen friendly libraries. And so you can reuse pretty much all of them. Um, in your runtime, so you don't need to like code every crypto primitives, for example, from scratch. Um, so I see we have a few more questions. Um, someone asked, could you talk about EVM Plus? How it's implement? How long it takes to develop it? Um, I will talk a bit more about this in the Akala session. Um, you mentioned like clients, which means we can run a night node on laptops or mobile. Um, exactly, you can run in the um, you can run in, in part of iOS app. Uh, you can open a web page which include ship with a like client, and um, pretty much like even your TV, if you uh, run this modern JS browser, JS engine, you can run in your TV as well. Um, so that's the good thing about like clients is really lightweight and efficient. Uh, what are the main substrate competitors? Should we compare with Hyperledger? Um, that there are a lot of uh, discussions on this. I'm probably not going to have enough time to talk too much about this. Um, but obviously every blockchain building tools are more or less competitors to substrate. So I'm going to highlight um, one is for Substrate is a foundation for the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, it's actually born uh, born from the Polkadot original Polkadot repo. Uh, Parity was like building Polkadot, and then they found out, hey, we try we are building this in such a way that it's modularized. It could be also used to build power chains. Um, why not just build like make it a power chain a blockchain building framework? So they actually renamed the original Polkadot reports to Substrate. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you um, how Substrate can be used to build religion, and how it can be used to build the power chain. And, and then it can also be used other a lot of other purpose um, if you want to. Uh, a very quick um, uh, intros to Polkadot. So Polkadot is like, this is from the Polkadot light paper. Uh, it's a next generation blockchain protocols, a uh, nice entire network purpose built blockchains, allowing them to operate seamlessly together at scale. So a few things to highlight. So um, power chains, they are purpose built blockchains. They are not generalized blockchains, but they can be generalized blockchains. Uh, but even though they are purpose built to be a generalized blockchain, um, and then they also operate together at scale. Uh, so power chains, they communicate with each other. They are not just um, silos. Um, they work uh, at scale. So that solves the scalability problem. Um, so those slides actually from my other Polkadot talk. So, um, so I'm going to keep brief, uh, mostly highlighting um, how Substrate uh, is making those features possible. Uh, without going too deep on each individual uh, components. So Substrate supports like plug or consensus algorithm. Um, 
it's uh, it's actually it's very customizable. So Pol Polkadot right now ships with a hybrid concerns, Babe for the block productions and Grandpa for the block finalization. And then um, for power chains, you can use Cumulus to implement the power chain um, consensus. Uh, the Polkadot um, have a staking, it's a POS network. Uh, so that is the way to make the Polkadot truly decentralized by offering a big number of validators as well as very big number of nominators. So this is all achieved with the MPOS staking. The governance is a very important part. Uh, so because the governance is required to perform rent upgrade, and if you if a blockchain cannot the the upgrade is not enforced by the governance, the blockchain is always either like truly immutable. That means well, is cannot have new features, cannot have bug fixes. Um, that could be fine for certain use cases. But otherwise, you need to have governance. Otherwise, if you upgrade the blockchain without governance, without on-chain governance, then it's by definition a centralized process. So uh, this is a big part to make Polkadot decentralized. And the parachain validations is also built very uh, obviously in a decentralized manner uh, to ensure the shared security of parachains. Uh, you cannot just attack any particular parachains because Polkadot uh, is decentralized. You need to attack the whole Polkadot to attack a parachain, and that makes attacking a parachain very complicated and very expensive. Um, yeah, I've got to. So Babe um, is implement. So yes, yeah, actually allow Babe to be built. Uh, implement a lot of things that involve on-chain components and off-chain components. Uh, so the on-chain components is Babe Palace store on the on-chain logics of Babe. The off-chain components does all the, a lot of other interesting things, including VIF and um, all the actual determining the finalization process. So I'm going to skip Babe and Grandpa. Um, so yeah, obviously you can implement all these complicated concerns with Substrate. The chances are you can implement some other concerns algorithm if you want to. And beef is the new one. Uh, so right now, Pokemon Kusama does not have Bifi, uh, but in future, they will be upgraded to a version that does have it and allow Ethereum and other EVM chains to verify Polkadot finality proof. So in that way, Polkadot is able to add new consensus uh, on the run without performing a fork. And uh, POS, so this is very critical to make sure Polkadot is actually decentralized. Um, this process is very complicated. You can take the read the list if you want to. Um, so it's it's very computer intensive. Um, so uh, to perform optimizations, um, option worker is used. Um, so there's on-chain fallbacks, uh, but most of the time, uh, option worker is used to perform the uh, uh, calculations in the option and then submit the solutions to the on-chain. And then uh, on-chain logics will just compare the rating of the solution and pick the one with highest rating, uh, which is a much uh, less compute intensive work. And governance, um, so Polkadot implements the open governance. Well, Kusama have implemented open governance. Uh, Polkadot will be implement this one later. Uh, so this is a very uh, powerful governance uh, palette that enables a uh, very uh, advanced governance process. Um, so for example, the uh, uh, approval rate, support rates uh, changes based on the parameters and based on the track. So depending exactly what's being voting on, uh, the threshold and the time uh, would adjust different accordingly. So uh, a small tab, for example, uh, can take uh, a day and a big tab will require a week, for example. So all these things uh, are built to enable Polkadot governance to be truly decentralized. It's not controlled by a few uh, big whales. Um, everyone can 
involved in the participations. Uh, people can only participate on the things they're familiar with. Like for example, I'm a technical guy, so I'm happy to participate on the te technical related uh, governance proposals, but on marketing, for example, um, it's not my expertise. So I can delegate my votes to someone else uh, I uh, know, I trust, uh, for them to vote for me. So this is a liquid democracy. And I can lock my tokens uh, for a longer period of time to improve uh, the voting power so that uh, uh, the whales uh, that we, we don't have we have less issues on whales trying to manipulate the governance because like other people can just lock uh, more time to um, have achieving higher voting powers so all these um, are provided by substrates natively. And if you want to build new blockchains, you can easily just grab all these parlors and even have all these advanced governance process in your chain. And because everything is built in such a way that it's very customizable, so you can customize pretty much everything, the parameters, the curve, and all how many tracks you have um, without a lot of work. And the power chain validations, which is a super complicated process. So I'm not going to go through too much details. Um, but basically, uh, you can, parity can build Polkadot with Substrate doing this. Uh, if you are building some other, I don't know, uh, storage solutions or some other advanced solutions, it's definitely possible. Um, unless it's more complicated than power chain validations, which is a bit unlikely. A uh, good part, uh, important part is XCMP, uh, the question message passing that allows parachains to communicate with each other. So all this is possible uh, due to the design of substrate. Uh, for example, um, a parachain can validate a state on another parachain trustlessly uh, because, because everything is committed with Merkle proof uh, so you can create a proof to prove um, the state in other chains uh, without a lot of um, work because it's building such a way that makes this possible. Um, yeah, so you can, uh, well, we don't really have XMP right now, but we do have BMP and HRMP um, to allow relay chains and power chains to communicate. Uh, yeah, so XCM, I'm going to skip those. So, pause a bit to see more questions. What's the difference between power chain and relay chain? So, the purpose of relay chain is secure power chain. This is pretty much the solo purpose of relay chain. Uh, there are other features like staking, governance, um, actual dot transfer. Those things are the require the features to operate a blockchain. Uh, like you need to have token to make staking possible. You need to have staking to make sure the block production is decentralized. Um, so it's not like Polkadot want to build those features. Uh, they are those features are just necessary. The thing, the, the only goal Polkadot want to achieve is secure, share security to secure projects. And all the business logics are implemented projects. And um, so, uh, for example, um, all the staking and governance, eventually those features will be moved to power chains as well. And then we have a lot of community power chains and different projects, including Akala and other power chains uh, to implement all the actual uh, features. So next session, I'm going to talk a bit more about Akala and highlight um, a bit more of other unique features uh, we have used Substrate um, because we want to build a DeFi uh, platforms uh, for Web3. And existing platforms, that obviously they are great, um, but they are, uh, most of them have different limitations. And a lot of time, the limitations are limited by the platforms. If you want to build a smart country on Ethereum, your users kind of forced to pay ETH for gas fee. Uh, there are pretty much no alternatives. Like you can implement more advanced meta transitions, etc. 
but they are all just work around. You can't really just ask Ethereum say, hey, I really want to pay transition fee with um, DAI, for example, instead of ease. You cannot just do that. Uh, so those are uh, those um, difficulties can be addressed with substrate, and then when um, yeah, just use substrate to make the UX um, and as well other many other aspects improve them for the DeFi. A uh, very quick high level overview. Um, of the protocols that build by Kala. So we have a stable coin, we have a staking directives, we have an AAM. And uh, one last thing is we also have an EVN um, as well uh, in Akala. So um, there's a very high level uh, overview. So obviously we build on top of Polkadot shared security. We build our subtrain runtime, which involve module pilots. Uh, pilots from Substrate, uh, pilots we build ourselves. And then we also have an EVM Plus pilots, uh, allow people to write some of these smart contracts, deploy them, and communicate with all the native Substrate runtime pilots. And in future, we also do plan uh, to support the Wazen smart contracts once uh, it is production ready. And then people will be able to deploy uh, dApps uh, on top of um, the runtime that like they can write smart contracts or they can just uh, creating one using the protocols uh, implement using subtract pilots. So one thing, uh, one big important component um, in many DeFi protocol is Oracle. Uh, I haven't actually checked the data, but Chainlink uh, Oracles or Ethereum pays a lot of ease to feed the data on chain, a lot of ease. Things. And those things, why well, cost money, obviously. And that just makes Oracle operators to be expensive. And then obviously operators uh, want to send those transitions because they get paid. And they paid by the DeFi protocols or the either then then which eventually paid by the users. Um, as a DeFi chain, the Oracle data, well, at least the valid Oracle data, they are beneficial to the blockchain. Like we really shouldn't charging the Oracle providers to pay for the fees uh, if those data are helping the blockchain. Um, on Ethereum, there just no ways to say, hey, those transitions should be free. They're just not possible. Um, this is possible uh, if you build your chain with Substrate. You can customize the transition payment logics. Um, you can make the Oracle, a valid Oracle transitions to be completely free. Uh, you can check if it's indeed a valid uh, Oracle fee and if it's invalid, well, you can still charge the normal transition fees uh, to prevent spam attack on your blockchain. So for example, we can implement certain rate limiting a uh, uh, particular Oracle providers can only feed, say, one free transition per every five minutes, unless the price has differed more than, say, uh, 1%. And then you want to spend with free transitions, they will be charged, and uh, eventually they will be out of money. And uh, another thing is Oracle transition can be front run on Ethereum. So if one transition is going to I don't know, bump the price a lot, and then other, they will be created upcharge charge opportunities or MEV opportunities um, for people to front run transitions to, to do certain trades before the Oracle price capping. Or back run to um, uh, run certain transitions after Oracle price capping. So um, with Substrate, we can mark certain transitions to be uh, operational. So these are essentially prioritized transitions. Um, on Ethereum, there was once upon uh, the block so full, the gas price goes crazy high and a lot of Oracle fees failed um, because the Oracle uh, operators wasn't expecting the uh, gas price to be so high. Then they're creating a lot of chaos and they expect from the network stabilities. 
but operational transitions, they can always be included, uh, no matter what. A certain percent of the block space are reserved for operational transitions. And so that if someone just want to span the network or the network just busy uh, or for whatever reasons, uh, the Oracle transition will always go through in. And they are also, also always included in the front of the block. Um, so if someone see Oracle trend feed in the transition pool on Oracle front run it, uh, it wouldn't work because the creators will pack the Oracle transition first before the user transitions. So they just make a lot of attack vectors uh, impossible. You cannot just spend the block, make it so full uh, to delay Oracle feed, for example. So this improves the reduce the cost for the users because Oracle fees are free now and improve the securities of the network. Um, because we can customize the transition payment logics. So we can solve another big problem uh, on Ethereum that everyone had to pay transaction fees with ease. Um, so in Akala, uh, we implement the bring on guests uh, allow people to pay the transition fees with multiple tokens. Um, we have implemented a mini transition fee pool. The type size is tiny. Um, that is used to automatically for the transition fee swap features. And we also integrate the transition fee payment logics to the Akala swap directly. So any tokens that list on Akala uh, that can be directly or indirectly through some other uh, trading pairs, convert to the ACA native token, then those tokens can be used for transition fee payment purpose. So a dot users can just uh, XCN bunch of dot to Akala and start using it without acquiring any native tokens first. Um, Ethereum users can one whole bridge uh, ERC20s to Akala and then just start making transitions with them. Uh, similarly, other parachain users can just bridge the token, the parachain tokens, and then just start using the chain uh, without worrying about like, acquiring the native tokens for the fee. And the transition fee pool will just swap enough tokens, enough other tokens for the native token for the fee payment purpose. So let's like, quickly improve the user experience uh, they don't need to worry about the, another additional tokens um, for the fee uh, payment purpose only. Uh, we also used option workers to monitor the on-chain positions. Um, otherwise, uh, without this, we need that someone would need to run a server to run a bot to constantly monitor the, and trigger them. And then we need to come up with some smart ways uh, to incentivize people to run them because the protocol security actually depending on this. And then when you pay someone to run the server and then obviously they are costs and someone will need to pay for the cost. But with option workers, it solves this problem. Uh, the creators will automatically run all the option workers and the off-chain workers will just constantly iterate on the on-chain state and detect uh, if they can be liquidated. And when it detects they can be liquidated, it will send the unsigned transitions to liquidate the position. And again, because the off-chain worker is upgraded with runtime, so if, say, the liquidation logics have been changed uh, or the liquidation transition format have been changed, that wouldn't cause any troubles uh, because everything just upgrade together. Just, so this reduce a lot of operational overhead uh, for the network maintenance. Uh, but of course, you can still run your own bots to trigger liquidation if you really want to. Um, because the liquidation process is done through unsigned transitions. So as long as it's a valid validation, Anyone can just craft a transition, sending it uh, without paying for a transition fee. And we customize the transition pool logics. Well, or in other words, the transition pool allows the customizations 
for an uh, on-site transition to Verda Day. This transition is a Verda on-site transition. Uh, actually liquidate a transition uh, before including it to the transition pool and broadcast and for the broad producers to produce both with the transition. You cannot just create a fake but a liquidation and transitions. Uh, it will be rejected by the transition pool. Uh, it will not be included on the block. And we have the EVM plus. Uh, EVN is um, a fair, the uh, EVN is the most popular smart contract platforms. Uh, but EVN also come with its own problem. Uh, so uh, we have customized the EVN in such a way to address a lot of issues on EVN. So as I previously mentioned, the Moonbeam have um, customized the transition format in such a way to be there and compatible. Well, they're using exactly the same Ethereum format. Uh, we didn't do this on Akala. Uh, so that's why additional work are required to be both EVN and Substrate compatible. But again, uh, the fact we can do this highlights this is a very powerful feature. Akala actually supports both the Substrate transition format as well as Ethereum transition um, format and supports Ethereum signature. So we have customized the signature formats to take different kind of signatures and accepting all of them. And also customized the EVN, uh, implement a lot of features, uh, storage meters. Um, so a storage actually have to requires a storage deposit uh, to prevent the dust account issues as well as like uh, avoid people just uh, abuse the on-chain storage uh, without paying uh, the enough uh, funds for it. We're also building in such a way that you can actually interrogate um, EVNs um, using ESOS.js uh, but powered by the Polkadot.js so that you can using your existing Polkadot wallets uh, that doesn't support EVN to interact with Akala EVN. So the users can use the Polkadot world. So the Polkadot world users can use the existing wallets to interact with EVNs without requiring them to download, say, a Metamask. Uh, so you can use one wallet for the Akala uh, without two wallets. And the EVN plus have the runtime integrations. Um, that means uh, we have implement, expose a bunch of precompiles, and uh, people can use precompiles to uh, invoke Akala swap, uh, can invoke XCM transfers, uh, which is working in progress, and uh, can invoke uh, many other features powered by Akala. And ERC20 is also a first class citizen uh, in the Akala protocols. So all the, uh, all the Akala pilots support ERC20s. So for example, you can list ERC20 on a swap. Uh, you, can you can do XCN transfer ERC20s to other power chains. Uh, any, even on a transfer uh, page, you can just transfer ERC20s using the substrate pilots. Um, so uh, there's no additional special treatments are required for ERC20s. So people can just deploy the ERC20 contracts and they will just work with the rest of the system. Uh, we also implement a pretty um, fancy feature. Um, so delete EVM contracts can be troublesome. And if they were already realized this and they plan to remove the ability to delete contracts, um, which is, yeah, makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. Um, the main problem is that a contract can have a lot of data associated with it. And if you want to delete contracts, you need to delete all the associated data. And that creates the problem that if the contract is super popular, uh, have like thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of users, or just someone like spend it so hard. Um, the contract storage can be very big. 
And if you want to delete the contracts in a single block, in a single transition, the executions can take a long time. So that, that would be a problem, especially on the power chain scenarios. Um, that could sometimes, if the transition is too big to be deleted, um, it might never be able to delete that. Um, so implement those features um, to actually purge the removed data when the block is idle. So when someone delete contracts, it will mark contract as deleted, but it doesn't actually delete all the data immediately. Uh, instead, you do uh, include a task to the idle uh, queue. And then when the block is idle, uh, when uh, the user's transition have completed and there are still remaining block space, you start purging the data. And of course, it's purging uh, it's in such ways that I purge only a small amount of data uh, per block. So uh, eventually, all the data will be removed. Uh, but it does not impact uh, user transitions. It does not impact the security of the blockchain. You cannot use this as an attack vector. Uh, so this is another uh, very uh, useful, but not used enough features offered by substrates that you can do something when the block is idle. Uh, when you can do a lot of uh, clean up tasks, for example, uh, or some compute intensive, but not time critical tasks, uh, because that is doing the task when the block is idle. So it doesn't need, really doesn't need to require fees for that because the block space will be wasted anyway um, to make a lot of interesting use cases possible. Uh, we also suppose uh, that one way I, I showed in previous slides there, it's possible to build hybrid apps. That way is partially uh, substrate pilots, partially uh, smart contracts. Um, in my some other talks, I did explain the difference, like why you want to do that. But essentially, pilots are useful to implement like uh, compute intensive projects, but it need to be stable because pilot upgrades is takes time. It requires on chain governance process. On that hand, smart contracts can be much faster to iterate, but less features. Um, so you can build with both together and Tapio protocol, the stable sort protocol or Akala um, is implemented using this mechanism. So the Tapio team, they have created a stable sort palette uh, as the core functionalities. And then they also implement a bunch of smart contracts for the less important, but uh, things that could be subject to change very fast uh, using smart contracts uh, inside EVM Plus. And they communicate with each other um, through the precompiles to offer uh, this functionality. So they're just a new way to think about how you're building your devs. Uh, you don't need to build everything in Palace. You don't need to build everything in smart contracts. You could enjoy the both uh, benefits of both sides. And the liquid staking protocol is implemented using uh, Axiom. So yeah, this is just like, yeah, we, we, have, we have Axiom. Uh, we can control something uh, on the other chain. In this case, the remote chain is the Polkadot or Kusama. And other power chains also have liquid staking for other power chains. Um, so this could be uh, another interesting ways. Uh, to build protocols to control something on a different blockchain uh, in one blockchain. Um, yeah, so those are the things I want to talk today. I believe my time is up. So yeah, I have a bunch of links uh, that could be useful. Uh, take a look when you have time. Um, yes, thanks for uh, listening. I'm going to check the questions once more time. Um, how the Oracle Verify confirms the option data? Uh, that is pretty much um, how other normal Oracle works by, uh, because it's 
not really possible. So there are still some trust components in both. Um, Akala, we are trying to build DeFi blockchain. We're not trying to build Oracle blockchain. Um, so this is a hard problem to solve. And we're waiting for some other Oracle solutions, which multiple people are building to fully address this. But yeah, right now it's not fully decentralized. Um, but it does have some uh, checks to make sure, for example, the price doesn't go crazy, uh, takes medians or average for the data. So if one Oracle provider is feeding bad data, it doesn't have any impacts. The substrate use chain link or they are incompatible. Uh, the chain link EVN smart contracts are fully compatible because they are EVN, they runs on any EVN chains. Um, chain link, uh, we're building substrate pilots. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the status for that. Uh, it's not production ready. It might be ready at some stage. Uh, is there a bullet plate called for substrate build blockchain? Definitely, yes. Uh, there are official substrate building templates available. Uh, you can use to build power chains and solo chains. Uh, they are offered by party. So if you just go to the substrate uh, official website, and you should be finding from there. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, I think a new one just came in as well from Diego at the top. Um, if yeah. you want to build something over Akala, what would be useful for the Akala ecosystem? Um, well, that's a big question. A lot of things are useful. Um, I, but I'm probably not able to just tell all of them right now. Uh, but anything DeFi, uh, also, one, one thing I would like to highlight is that we, we really want to see something that leverage some unique features uh, available. Uh, on Kala, because if you just say, I don't know, copy paste a unit, swap and deploy it here, it can be useful, but it's not exciting. Um, yeah, so we, we offer a lot of unique features and trying to have you know, address some real problems we see on other places. Uh, we're really looking for someone to build something that actually solves those problems using the like some different features we provide. Awesome. Okay. Um, I think there might be just quickly a couple questions in the chat. I'm not sure if you fully addressed these earlier. Um, there are just a couple of questions from Teresa. Thank you guys. Yeah, of course. Um, if you guys do need to go, I know we've running just a tiny bit over. So um, feel free to head off if you have to. Um, there's a couple of questions from Teresa in the chat about Rust. Is Rust the only language to use this technology and will it always be this way? Um, yeah, for if we want to build substrate, the substrate is built with Rust. So uh, if you want to build a substrate, you need to use Rust. On the other hand, uh, I previously already mentioned um, the core to all the power chains um, is Wasm. Um, so once there is a framework available in different languages, you would be able to use different language to build the words of right time um, and build a power chain with it. And I believe there are multiple teams working on this. Uh, I don't think they are production ready, but still uh, do some research. They, you, they might be something you can use today. I'm not very sure. Um, there's another one. Okay. Are there instructions on how to use AI to implement this for someone who is not a Rust dev? How can we use this? Um, you really need to be a developer to do this. But right now, um, AI are great for assistance. Uh, like I personally use it on every day. Uh, it's in integrated with my development flows. I uh, use AI to uh, help me to write the code. But it doesn't write the code for me. Um, well, I kind of does, but uh, I'm not going to run any AI code without a uh, review and fix it. Um, so it's still not like something you can do today to, hey, I want to blockchain, it gives you a chain, it run, it works. What's most likely going to happen is you tell it, I want to build a blockchain, to give you some code. You need to do some tweaks, modifications, fix a bunch of issues. Uh, reviewing a bird, and then you will have it. So it saves time, but you still need to have the knowledge about it. 
Awesome, thank you so much. I think that's all we have time for. Um, Teresa, just to add on that, um, I think Rust is quite particular. So if, if you are looking to develop in Rust, I think really understanding the language and how it works, especially um, with Substrate, it will be important and it will be the best, like being able to do that will give you the best out of itself and substrate so um do give it a go give give uh if you have some time give us some go um do you have do we have a hackathon coming up oh great great question actually one of the things that i was meant to mention today and almost forgot <laughs> so we do actually have a polka dot hackathon coming up um let me just send you to our landing page um bounties aren't confirmed yet but we will be having several different tracks, hopefully, um, and we'll be announcing that soon. So if you guys are interested, thanks, Ryan. If you guys are interested in a hackathon, uh, especially after this um, Educate series, then please do sign up now. You'll be notified, uh, notified, <laughs> notified later on. Um, uh, with, with details on like you know when we're going to start and all of the uh, intro sessions but please do sign up here now um, to be reminded and also one more thing we have an AMA tomorrow with Pierre Chouzville from um, who is an investor at Lattice and is also a, one of the co-founders of Dove Metrics so um, Pierre has a lot of uh, really great expertise um, on sort of fundraising and investments, uh, especially in the Web3 space. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, please do come along. Um, so that's kind of it for the announcements. Uh, Brian, thank you so, so much uh, for coming to talk today. That was like a really in-depth session um, on how to use Substrate and like what you can do with it, especially. Um, I think that's really, really interesting to explore, uh, especially through the case studies, because you, um, you can get to understand the use cases really well. Um, Connor asks, is that, on, is that on at the same time with Pierre? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by this. Um, I think so. The uh, the AMA tomorrow is at five thirty PM GMT. Um, so about the same time, yes, same time as today's session, but tomorrow for about an hour. So um, please do come along if you can make it. No problem. Um, Brian, thank you so much again. Do you have any final words to share to the group? Um, yeah, building a substrate can be frustrating, <laughs> um, speaking from real experience. But um, it's again as building any Web3 uh, technologies because this is very different, very new. Uh, but it can, so it can be very exciting. Uh, like you can build something that was simply possible with uh, simply impossible without with the with traditional technologies. So yeah, having fun and just prepared for the journey. Awesome. Thank you for the kind words. All right. Uh, I will end the session there. Thank you guys for staying. Um, and we will see you. Well, I will see. I will see you next Thursday for the next educate uh, session. So I'll see you then. Stay tuned. Bye, guys.